Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this update for global stocks and commodities for the 25th of November. The, the, um, the point I want to make in this week's video is that, uh, <clears throat> you know, most people have a fixation on what the indices are doing. And uh, the decision as to whether we're in a bull market or a bear market uh, revolves almost entirely around the position of the indices. But what I'm seeing at the moment is a tremendous divergence in markets, and we're seeing a, a very significant rotation occurring uh, from uh, technology stocks in the States, which have been the market leaders for uh, a number of years now, uh, into other sectors of, uh, of the stock market. So I think if you're just looking at, at the indices and, and trying to work out uh, whether we're in a bull market or a bear market, you, you're probably going to be quite misled because it depends a heck of a lot on what you actually own at, a, uh, at an individual stock level. So uh, that's what I want to pursue today. Um, so how do we go about managing uh, what is a major sector rotation, at least for a medium term period? It's always tricky. Uh, the, the way that you think about the market, the processes that you use to, um, to manage your risk and to, and to make profit uh, needs a, a fairly radical readjustment. Um, you know, it really does. If you just want to do the same old, same old, then the market's going to, uh, you know, carve you up during these periods of, of corrections that can last anywhere from, uh, from three months to in excess of a year. And for most people, the longer um, periods of, uh, of a difficult market are, are very difficult to cope with. So we'll have a look at the normal stock and commodity trend updates as well. Uh, portfolio analyst last week, uh, I looked at some attractive Australian uh, dividend paying alternatives to the banks and, uh, and to Telstra, which have been the mainstays of Australian investing for years and years. But uh, the... There are some actually some significantly better ways to go about that. I also looked at the opportunities in energy. It looked as though energy had perhaps found a base and turned back up again, but it got another absolute pasting on Friday night uh, with the price of crude oil down to uh, $50 a barrel now. <coughs> so uh, it looks as though the selling in energy hasn't finished yet. And I also did a recap on some just terrific Australian microcaps that... Uh, have, uh, have held up extremely well. In fact, some of them have actually gone up during the last uh, couple of months, um, you know, against the trend of the, the overall global correction, and uh, have got enormous upside. And they're, and they're still on modest uh, to low PE ratios as well. So they're hard to find, but there's some uh, terrific opportunities within the Australian market. So just a dose of reality to start with. It's important to distinguish between what the main indices are doing and what stocks and sectors are doing. And many stocks, both in Australia and in America, are in strong bear markets. In Australia, pretty much anything to do with a housing cycle is, uh, is just absolutely getting uh, carved up. You look at building materials stocks like Borel and, and um, Adelaide Brighton Cement, uh, they're well in excess of 30%. Uh, down, uh, you look at a lot of building services companies, um, and you know so on, and the list goes on to do directly with the housing cycle. Um, suppliers of uh, you know of building materials, plumbing fittings, uh, all those sort of things. All those stocks are under pressure. That's creating a negative wealth impact, and that's certainly going through and affecting retail and also uh, consumer credit. Um, and, uh, and many other areas of, of the Australian economy because it's a real snowball effect. The construction cycle and the retail uh, part of the Australian economy are the second and third largest employers in the country. Um, so when you get a downturn in, um, uh, in both of those areas, the spin-off then into every other part of the economy is substantial. And of course, the other dynamic we're seeing in Australia is that high PE growth stocks are being derated, and, and that's happening around the world. It's not just Australia. And so we've seen some very, very good businesses that are, that are actually unchanged. The businesses are great. It's just that the PE ratios were way too high, and uh, we're going through a very substantial derating. And uh, I think it's probably still got some time to run yet. 
if we look at America, and, and that's not the definitive list on Australia, but they're the main ones. But if we look at America, uh, you've got several groups within technology that, uh, that include um, semiconductors, mobile payments, um, you know, the, the list goes on. And, and of course, the FANG stocks are, uh, are coming back uh, very sharply. Uh, you've got housing, uh, materials, biotechnology, uh, all under pressure, all down by more than 20% from their peak. In, uh, in retail, uh, it's not in a bear market yet, but it's getting close. And there are a lot of stocks within retail that are in bear markets in excess of 20% um, of off their peaks. So there certainly are many areas of, um, of the markets around the world that are actually in, in bear markets and strong bear markets where uh, falls of between 30 and 50% are, are common. So if we turn to American stocks now, the S&P uh, was down a fairly robust 3.8% for the week. Um, and th look, the explosion of technology, technology is not dead. So the explosion of technology in all its forms, driverless car technology, Internet of Things, um, 5G revolution, uh, you know, the list goes on and on, mobile payment technologies, that's going to continue to expand at a, at a tremendous rate. Um, so there's, there's, really no, uh, there's really no change there, no slackening of the pace of the growth of technology. But what's happened is that a lot of the stocks that have just become so overvalued, uh, are now their prices are in, are in bear markets. And uh, you've just got to step back and, and get out of the way of that, uh, of that trend. Now, the US dollar was, uh, was higher on the week. Um, and it's a very interesting situation because uh, high yield debt, which we'll take a look at, and I, I think I looked at it last week, um, the high yield debt ETF uh, broke support, which means that the yield for high yield for high uh, risk debt is going up, which is exactly what you'd expect. And it's almost a case of, you know, well, it's about time. Uh, but mysteriously, the 10 year Treasury yield uh, has actually fallen. So the, the Treasury yield has been on the way up uh, all year, got to 3.25%. And with the Fed still seemingly on track to keep raising uh, the uh, the cash rate, uh, it seemed a no-brainer that the 10-year yield would continue to rise. But in fact, it's actually come back. So uh, that's a pretty um, that's a pretty interesting dynamic. But what it means is, of course, that the spread between uh, high-quality uh, guaranteed debt, which is U.S. government debt and the high yield corporate debt is actually widening and that's really what should be happening. So it's a bit of a mixture of, uh, of signals from the bond market at the moment. So let's jump in and take a look at, um, at some of these uh, charts. So this is the S&P at a big picture level. This is a monthly chart. Here's the lows in uh, 2009 and uh, here's the lows after the 2000 uh, crash in the market. So you can see that uh, this is certainly starting to look a lot nastier now because for the first time um, in this entire bull market, we now have substantial month back-to-back -to -back monthly losses. Now, we've still got a week to go in America, so I guess this could turn around and, and look a little bit better over the next week. But, you know, at the index level, this is... Um, this is not looking all this, all that terrific. Now, it hasn't broken the January lows, uh, the February lows. So, therefore, technically, uh, you know, we're still okay. And we could just get uh, a, a broad-ranging consolidation for a while and then resume the uptrend. Um, it's just, you know, too early to say at this stage. This is the daily chart. Uh, these are the, the boundaries that I've put around this that are key support and resistance levels, 26.05 and 30, uh, 28, uh, 15. Um, so really looking for what the index is going to do uh, above or below those, uh, those two levels. Now you can see that the, uh, the red line, the 200 day moving average has flattened out, starting to point down slightly. The index is spending a lot more time beneath it. 
but at least on the recent run up at uh, the start of November, it, the uh, the price was able to get back above the 200 day and uh, got to uh, an exact double top with the um, the mid October peak. So if we look at some of the other indices, so if we look at the Nasdaq, you could see we were unable to get to the prior peak, and we're now we've now broken the October lows. So the Nasdaq clearly is weaker than the S&P, and that's uh, a reflection of what's happening with the Fang stocks that are uh, that are still being sold down quite heavily. Um, in particular, Apple is um, is really getting um, is really getting some pretty severe treatment. Uh, if we look at the Dow Jones, um, the Dow Jones is really interesting, um, and we had a very big fall last week. Um, you can see that the Dow Jones was down by um, by a, a, more than a thousand points uh, last week, so quite a significant pullback in the Dow, which had been looking better. Uh, and finally, we've got uh, the Russell. Now you can see the Russell 2000 for small caps is a lot worse than the S&P. Um, the Russell had been leading the way uh, for more than a year. Um, I guess perceived beneficiary of, uh, of the tax cuts more so than the big stocks. But you can see just how far below the 200 day moving average the Russell is. The fact that the um, this was a very weak rally and we're back down to the lows again. So the Russell looking very weak. So clearly there is a big divergence uh, in America as there is uh, in Australia between different stocks and, and sectors of the market. So I think just looking at the indices is, um, you know, is probably a bit redundant because most people, you know, don't don't trade or, or own the indices. Now the other one I want to look at. So let's look at H H Y G. Sorry, I don't have that chart here. So this is the uh, this is the high yield debt, and you can see that we've uh, we had a, a spike down when we had the February correction, but you can see that we've now uh, broken those lows. So the value of of uh, of corporate uh, high yield corporate bonds is falling, which means the yield is rising, and that's exactly what should happen when things are getting uh, you know when things are getting uncertain. So we've definitely got a breakdown in um, in the high yield corporate debt. Um, <clears throat> and if we look at the uh, ten year, so this is the uh, TNX, which is the ETF that reflects the uh, the ten year Treasury yield. Then we had an important um, important resistance that was broken in early October, late September, early October. Um, but we've now had a pullback. Now I'm not quite sure what that's going to do, but it's just a little surprising in this environment that um, that we've not seen a uh, a bigger uh, move out of um, out of Treasuries, given where the uh, where the interest rate cycle is is going, um, so yeah, some slightly mixed, confusing messages coming from the bond market. But I think the main thing is that there's not there's not a, there's no signs of panic in the bond market, which would be really bad for stocks. So the bond market still seems to be you know quite calm and and relatively orderly. We're just now starting to trend in a way that would be normal given the economic circumstances. Turning to Aussie stocks, um, our uh, our dollar eased back a bit, got up to seventy three and a half during the week. Uh, we're still in a short term uptrend there. The index got away with it pretty mildly, but I guess there'll be more selling on on uh, Monday to reflect what happened on Friday night in the states. Uh, so we were down uh, just 02 percent for the week. Um, but the key issue with Australia, with so many sectors and stocks now in clearly in bear markets, as I covered earlier, where are the higher probability opportunities in the Australian market? To me, there are two main areas, and I've been focusing on these now for months, and uh, you know, this gets a lot of airplay in Portfolio Analyst and also my other um, subscription services. The two areas 
are under the radar micro caps and they span a, a, a whole raft of different niche industries but there's some tremendous opportunities in, in the Australian market these stocks are uh, you know they're high growth stocks they're profitable they've got great balance sheets uh, they're on modest to low PE ratios of somewhere around 10 to uh, to 15 and uh, and they've got a very very strong niche so the upside for these stocks uh, looks extremely appealing and the other area is uh, stocks that are the that probably just got the great businesses they just got ahead of themselves and got too expensive but they've now come back and they're now oversold and undervalued now not all of them are um, you know a lot of the high PE flyers have not come back nearly far enough yet to to fit into this category of being oversold and undervalued but there really are <clears throat> some outstanding Australian businesses now that um, and, and some of them are in the top 100, so they're not all small speculative stocks um, that are looking very attractive. So for me, they're the two main areas of opportunity within the Australian market. Let's take a look at, uh, at our indices now. Um, so I'll just run through them quickly. This is energy. So these are all daily charts. So energy in the Australian market has... Uh, has come off a long way. That's largely a reflection of Woodside and and Santos. Um, so we've come down from twelve thousand six hundred to ten thousand. That's a that's a twenty five percent fall. Um, there's the uh, the finance sector, the banks stabilised a little bit in the last month or so. But you can see clearly the red two hundred day moving average line is still um, clearly moving down, and the and the price of the uh, banking index is is way below it. Uh, there's healthcare. Um, it's also off a fair bit, but it had just got ahead of itself. This is the ASX 200, and we're uh, we've been testing this really critical uh, support that goes back uh, quite a long period of time. So you can see we managed a breakout that occurred in uh, in the middle of the year. We've now come back. We've broken that breakout, and we're now testing the um, the prior key support level so um, I wouldn't be at all surprised given what I'm seeing on an individual stock level if uh, if the index does in fact break 5600 and uh, and go lower uh, this is materials so largely BHP and Rio um, you can see there that we've got uh, the 200 day moving averages rolled over and we are forming lower highs and lower lows so that sector is in downtrend and just to finish off this is the small cap uh, sector of the Australian market uh, also clearly in quite a sharp downtrend as well so while I'm here just look at the Australian dollar so we managed to manage to scramble just above the um, the September highs just for a day um, so I think we can sort of ignore that because it was only one day and we're so we're really in a in a range at the moment between 70 and a half and around 73 and a half at the moment All right moving on to um, oh just one final point on the Australian market most traditionally diversified portfolio stocks so if you're invested in the banks and Telstra and West farmers and all those sort of stocks it's just really not where you want to be at the moment if you want to make progress if, if you're just interested in dividends and, and that's good enough well you know that's okay you probably don't need to do much but I can tell you that the risk of, of capital loss erasing those dividends is is quite real uh, but if you actually need some growth in your portfolio to build your wealth up then the traditional diversified portfolio is, is just not going to do it. It's not where you want to be at the moment. And it's hard to see us returning to those, um, those sort of conditions. Now turning to precious metals, uh, gold was higher to 12.24, so it was up uh, just a couple of dollars on the week. Um, and as I said last week, we need to break above 12.45 on, um, on gold to... Um, you know, for things to be looking better there. Precious metal stocks, really no change uh, in precious metal stocks. Um, let's just take a look at uh, at that gold market. 
So if we look at um, gold on a weekly chart, you can see only a fairly minor change and pretty small range on the week. So we're still really just sort of stuck in this. Yes, we've got a short term uptrend going, but it's not really um, we need to get above this level here, 1245, to, for it to look any more promising. GDX still not doing anything. So this is a weekly chart. Now, bear this, uh, bear this chart in mind. So they're the global majors. Now let's look at my favorite um, gold stock and has been for a long, long time, and that's Northern Star uh, Resources. This is a daily chart but let's put it on a weekly chart so that we can compare it with, with global gold stocks. And as you can see, it is absolutely chalk and cheese between those, uh, between those two. So Northern Star back in, um, in December of 2014 was trading at a dollar. Now we're trading between eight and nine dollars and there is a very, very clear uptrend, long-term uptrend in, um, in play there with Northern Star. So uh, tremendous divergence uh, between uh, between that stock and uh, and most of the others, uh, other commodities. Copper was up uh, very slightly, um, and LME inventories are, are back into their very strong downtrend. We had a blip for a week where inventory levels uh, actually went up, but um, you know we're we're back down in a very strong downtrend, and it's really. Um, it's really confusing as to why copper has not responded, uh, you know, better than uh, than it has given the supply demand situation. Uh, crude oil, uh, gee, it wasn't that long ago. It was about seven weeks ago that crude oil was trading at seventy six and a half. Now we're down at fifty and a half. It's been an extraordinary um, fall, eleven uh, percent last week, thirty four percent since the peak. And, um, you know, it's all about uh, two things, fears of a global slowdown. So that's being factored into the futures market uh, and also rising U.S. shale production, which is pushing up, um, pushing up crude oil inventories. So they've done a huge amount of damage in, um, in the last few weeks. Uh, this spot copy, you can see not much movement. Um, and there's the one-year London Metals Exchange warehouse levels. So you can see a one-week blip in those levels went up about 40,000 tonnes, which doesn't seem very likely to be. I, I think there's um, the the way that uh, this data is reported is uh, is really hard to get to the to the bottom of it. So um, I, you know, I think it's safe to say that the copper warehouse levels are still in sharp decline. They're getting down to sort of historical lows and uh, and yet we're not seeing the move in copper. So it's a very strange situation. Copper really should be looking stronger than it is. Uh, there's the big plunge in crude oil, uh, which has occurred since um, the correction started in October. In fact, one could conclude that perhaps the, the, um, uh, the fall in the crude oil market uh, could well be influencing the, the fall in the equities market and, uh, and not the other way around. And here it is on a, on a one-year chart. You can see just how dramatic that, uh, that decline has been. And we've, uh, we're now at, at the yearly lows. So we've taken out the low point uh, from January. So it's been an amazing turnaround in crude oil. So to wrap it up, um, look, this is a it's a time to be careful, cautious, um, but there are opportunities. Um, there are opportunities now, there's a few of them, but there are a lot of opportunities that are building because the more that share prices fall of the really good stocks, then the better and better the buying becomes. So I'm, I'm, uh, I have great anticipation about the next three, six, 12 months. I think there's going to be amazing opportunities. There is a huge under... Uh, rotation underway, uh, but look, when you compare being in the stock market to being, you know, the, you don't want to be in the bond market. Um, in most places around the world, you don't want to be in the property market. Um, you don't want to be in cash when interest rates are still low, but inflation is rising. So really, there is nowhere, there's nowhere better to go than equities. So we're not seeing 
massive amounts of money coming out of the stock market. We're just seeing it rotate into different areas. And that's why you just got to be a bit smarter about how you go about things. If you just stick to the traditional path that you've been on for the last 10 years, then you're probably going to underperform. Wonderful opportunities come from irrational selling and, the, and there will be uh, spikes of irrational selling um, because more and more people now are starting to buy into the negative outlook and, uh, and the media is certainly feeding that. <clears throat> I'm feeling exceedingly comfortable with this market, probably as comfortable as I've been all year, but it depends very much on your positioning. You've got to be positioned correctly and you've got to be accessing opportunities in the, in the areas that I mentioned before that, um, that are highly likely to A, not fall and B, go up. Um, and look, feeling in control of what you're doing, um, not necessarily in control of the market because no one can do that, but feeling confident and in control of what you're doing is just so vital because it helps you minimize mistakes. When you're feeling nervous and anxious about the market, you, you're trying to second guess things, you, you're jumping all over the place, and you generally end up making a lot of mistakes. So um, it's really important to, um, you know, to be in that space. Portfolio analysts this week, um, you know, quite obviously, I'm going to be looking where we can make money reliably in what is a poor overall market. And that poor sentiment could last for a while yet. Um, so, you know, I think it's really important to know where you, where you can go to, um, to minimize your downside and, and maximize your upside. There's my contact details for those that uh, aren't members of, uh, of any of the services, and um, we'll see what the next week brings. Cheers.